Folks, game two of the Rick Bonus era has finally concluded, and the Jets emerged victors against the Ottawa Senators. But while the scoreline might look decently favorable for Winnipeg, there are some things that I think are going to be growing pains and uh, maybe some signs of, of needing improvement as we head into the regular season. But at the end of the day, the Jets still won. We'll talk about how they got the win and what it might mean for the future coming right up on tonight's episode of Locked On, Winnipeg Jets. You're locked on the Hockey Jets, your daily podcast on the Winnipeg Jets. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends, and welcome to this episode of Locked On Winnipeg Jets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Harrison Lee, an avid Winnipeg Jets fan and an online blogger. You can follow me on Twitter at HLLivingLoco and at LO underscore Winnipeg Jets. As always, thank you for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to like, follow, and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform of choice, including Apple, Spotify, Google, Megaphone, Odyssey, and YouTube. Doing so is completely free of charge and ensures you never miss another episode. But most of all, we just really love and appreciate your support. Now, on tonight's episode, like I said, we're going to be talking about uh, Ottawa versus Winnipeg, which, you know, like I said in the previous episode, Ottawa didn't exactly bring its A team. If anything, we basically saw like the Belleville uh, Senators, which, yeah, not exactly the kind of team that you would expect Winnipeg's more veteran heavy lineup to really struggle with. But you know, surprisingly, Winnipeg was not that great. Although, if you follow this team over the years, maybe you would uh, you would expect the Jets against the Sens to not have the most productive outing. Uh, every time we seem to play the Sens, they just give us fits for some reason. Either we score like five goals, but we still play like crap, or the Jets just lose in really pathetic fashion. And you kind of wonder what exactly happened and what went wrong. But, you know, it's a new era under Rick Bonus. This is a time for the Jets to kind of wipe the slate clean and start over. And so this was maybe a little bit of exercising some demons and hopefully getting the Jets to a more competitive state. And, uh, you know, a, a tune-up game against the Sens in the preseason, perfect opportunity to see what you've got. We're going to focus on the holistic view uh, at first and then kind of focus on some more specific moments, maybe some standout players, um, some problem areas that I think the Jets are going to want to work on. But, uh, you know, from the overall perspective, I thought Winnipeg just has a sort of average game. For about half to two-thirds, the Jets really struggled to create offense. Um, and this was kind of up and down the lineup. You know, it wasn't just the depth forwards. If anything, I actually thought uh, the bottom couple of lines were among the most creative and impactful of the game. The first line of Shifley, uh, Ehlers, and um, uh, it was Connor, I thought was just okay. You know, Shifley kind of did himself, uh, you know, the, the, the way that he can do with great passes, a couple of good scoring opportunities, some good vision. I thought he looked a little more defensively involved than we've seen in previous seasons. But, you know, as far as like the scoring up was concerned, we didn't really see a ton from this unit. Uh, Kyle Connor bagged himself a couple of goals, one on the power play. And I forget what the other one was. Maybe it was even strength or something. But regardless, you know, Winnipeg, they are looking to really make this unit uh, like a, a recurring theme, I think, going forward because it gets Wheeler off the top line. You get Ehlers first line minutes and Nick might be the guy to help, um, you know, two skaters who might need a little bit more of a transition assistance. I know, I know that Kyle is like an amazing one on one matchup guy, but Ehlers is kind of the one who really stirs the drink when you've got him on a unit. So hopefully this line really performs I don't know if I think this trio long term is going to be the best version of the first line, but we'll see how it handles once the regular season rolls around and these guys shake off the rust. The second line of Perfetti, Wheeler, and um, Lowry I thought was decent. Uh, Lowry and, and, and Perfetti and Wheeler all seem to find themselves in really good scoring opportunities. I thought Perfetti was making really good passes, a couple of good quick one-touch uh, setups and sequences that saw Wheeler almost score, which is something you love to see because obviously Blake is still a very uh, big contributor to this team, and I think they're not going to stop giving him top six minutes unless something really changes. So, uh, you know, that that being the case, right, 
you need to still make him a productive member. And when it comes to to Perfetti, you need somebody who thinks on kind of his wavelength because he's like a super smart player. Uh, Oftentimes he is maybe the most intelligent player on the ice. And even against McDavid, you might still argue that his spatial awareness and understanding of the game is still at a level that's comparable to what Connor can do. So, you know, Perfetti is a genius level player, and it's often hard to find guys who are on the same page as him, which is why it was nice to see him have good chemistry with Blake and Lowry. I thought that despite not really scoring anything tonight, uh, this trio was in really good spots to create some good uh, scoring opportunities, which I think is going to be really critical going forward. It's just whether or not they can punch those pucks in, that remains one of the biggest questions. Now, I'm going to skip over the depth forwards for now because some of the some of those guys are kind of on my list of standouts. But as far as the defense is concerned, I thought the blue line unit wasn't really good for most of the game. Uh, just about everyone except for Morrissey really struggled. Josh, I thought, had a really great game, but you kind of expect that for the most part. The rest of the defense, it was kind of like having a bunch of Nate Bolus in the lineup, which for those of you who remember what Bolu did for this team, you probably do remember some of the more defensive lapses and stuff, uh, more so than the physicality and hitting that he brought. So, yeah, if you can imagine what that was like, it wasn't great. It did shift towards the end of the game, and the defense seemed to at least corral itself enough to be passable. But for most of the game, yeah, just about everyone on the blue line unit really struggled. And I don't know if it was rust or the Jets just kind of being the Jets. I know that it's kind of funny to say because preseason rust is always a thing. But with Winnipeg, you know, the kind of stuff that they were rusty with in terms of reads, timing, passing and stuff, all of that is just Winnipeg being Winnipeg on most other days. So let's hope that these guys have a bit bit of a turnaround in form. I think a number of these players really need to show up big time this season and hopefully give us a year to remember that is positive and not negative. But of course, like I said, I have some standout moments and things that I wanted to focus on in just a little bit. We'll talk about what these points are in just a few seconds. But before we go any further, I do want to shout out our friends and partners at BetOnline.net. BetOnline is your number one source for all of your football betting info this season. Whether you're into college football or pro football, they've got you covered and they've got all the latest player developments, team matchups, news, podcasts, in-depth analysis, and everything in between. They've got everything starting from the first week of all of your favorite seasons up until the present moment. And they've also got futures if you want to start doing some predictive betting and get ahead of the game. As always, they've remained your continued source for all of your sporting wagering information with live betting, up to the minute scores, and all the analysis and news you can possibly handle. And no matter what your sport in, uh, no matter what sport you're into, they've got you covered with MLB baseball, MMA, boxing, golf, horse racing. I've even looked up German soccer with the Bundesliga there. They've got just about every sport you can possibly imagine. And if you don't love sports, which why are you listening to me talk? Uh, But say that's you anyways, be sure to check out their Vegas casino games because they want to be something for everyone. To get started, go to betonline.net on your laptop or mobile device to register for a free account because BetOnline is where the game starts. Hello, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked On Jets. We are taking a look at, uh, you know, Winnipeg versus Ottawa, although calling it the Ottawa Senators is probably a bit of a stretch. It was mostly the Belleville Senators, if we're being honest. And uh, as you can imagine, the performance of the team wasn't superb in certain areas. Before we dive into some of the more specific granular elements and players, I just wanted to say, again, thank you so much for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day, and encourage you to like, follow, and subscribe right now if you haven't already done so, whether it's on YouTube or your favorite podcasting platforms of choice. Now, back to talking about the Jets. Obviously, Winnipeg had, you know, a bit of a mixed bag. The offense really struggled for half the game. The defense wasn't good for almost the whole night, and so you had a um, bit of an uneven performance. And I I get it. Preseason rust and all that is a thing. But the Jets just really have to show up. And I think that's that's kind of the bottom line. You don't really have a lot of time to tune up before the regular season starts. And, you know, these next two years are among the most critical in in the franchise's history, because this is about all the time that we have with everyone still under contract after like 23, 24, things start getting really scary really quickly. So yeah, <laughs> it's really imperative that the Jets put on a good show. Now, as far as like the veterans uh, are concerned that I thought had good nights, I would say, 
Uh, Josh Morrissey really stood out positively. I thought he was a really impact player. Uh, he was leading transitions and breakouts. I thought that his work through the neutral zone and into the offensive zone was sound. He did some good defensive zone work along the boards. Um, his passing and distribution under pressure, I thought for the most part, was pretty good. I mean, he just looks a lot more confident and comfortable, which is good to see. Um, and what's interesting is it's kind of independent of his his, his like pairing partner, right? Uh, he was working with Simon Lundmark, and Lundmark was not uh, particularly outstanding this evening. Got victimized for one particular goal that was, you know, something we might attribute more to Logan Stanley. But Morrissey didn't really seem too bothered by uh, playing with Lundmark, which is good because if Morrissey can carry his own pairing for the most part, and you can give him somebody who's just a really good complementary D, I think that bodes well for trying to balance the pairings a little bit more evenly and spreading out the talent. So. Uh, kudos to Josh. I'm just happy to see that he is happy himself. I know it's been a difficult past couple of years for him. And so having Morrissey happy uh, and, and really leading the charge of this blue line unit would be ideal. Uh, as far as the other blue liners who I thought had really good nights. Yeah, it, it's a bit of a short list. I thought Dylan was fine enough. You know, it wasn't great, but he did his job. And I think that's probably the most of what you can say for a lot of the defenders. Now, of the guys who were competing for that final roster spot, you know, uh, Sandberg had a rough night. Lundmark had a rough night. Um, Stanley, of course, we saw the other night was just a bit of a disaster. And Heinola, for a good portion of this game, was really a non-factor. Uh, I thought some of his passes were poor. He wasn't really getting physically engaged. He just really wasn't having the sort of impact that uh, we really expect him to. And it, it, it was holding true until he finally scored a goal. And this was a great rush led by Lowry and a few others. And Heinola was just there for the redirect to tip it home and, and create a great goal scoring chance. The keeper never really had a shot to save this one. And so Heinola bagged his goal. And then all of a sudden it's like his game regained that confidence that we're used to seeing. Uh, he was making really good stretch passes. He was exiting the defensive zone quickly. And you kind of saw him do more of those Heinola rotations those breakout skates, all that stuff that we're used to seeing with Villy. So I think long-term he'll probably get the number six spot because I think when you look at this roster, right, and you look at the lack of offensive scoring punch, which that is going to be an issue not just in the preseason but going forward even with the full lineup, the Jets desperately need to find goals from other sources, and that's going to mean that the back end is really crucial. Now, while I think Sandberg is, you know, not just a defensive defenseman. I think he's got, you know, pretty good skating and possession, and he's got a nice shot. He just doesn't really have the dynamism that Heinola brings. Vili can be used in so many different situations, whether it's on the power play or in creating good even strength scoring chances. I think he had a two point night this evening, including an assist. And so Heinola, for me, is just he's the guy that I think makes the most sense for trying to fit to Bone's system. Um, I know, again, that people are going to say, well, he doesn't really defend. And yeah, that is true. I think his defensive work, it's improving a little bit by bit, but it's not at a level where I would say, you know, he's supplanting Dylan DeMello or Brendan Dylan in terms of total defensive impact. But what you're looking for from him is really fast transition, great breakouts, uh, those long stretch passes, the up ice vision that makes uh, a lot of uh, teams really wary to avoid clogging up the neutral zone. You want to have him be a threat constantly in all three zones of the ice so that you force opponents to adapt to him and start to play him differently, right? And then that creates opportunities and spaces for other players on the team to get into good scoring chances and take advantage of Heinola and similar players drawing attention. So I think for me, Vili has probably, even with just a, a quiet performance, relatively speaking, still earned this role unless something really changes. Um, I just think he is the guy that gives bonus the most flexibility in terms of having a really aggressive blue line and also having a unit that can be trusted to have maybe another puck, uh, puck carrying quarterback on the back end to create offense. So yeah, fun night for him, but it wasn't just Tynola that, th that I thought maybe, you know, with for a little bit and we'll take a look at what these guys did and how they might fit into Winnipeg's plans in just a little bit. 
Hello, friends, and welcome back to this episode of Locked On Jets. We are closing out tonight's episode with some quick thoughts on some of the, some of the standout players that really had uh, big games in terms of, um, you know, whether it's scoring output or just, I thought for me, space creation, forechecking, general skills and stuff that are really important for this team, especially in depth rules. If anything, for this game against the Sens, uh, Winnipeg's bottom two lines showed up in a pretty big way, and in particular, the fourth line had a really prominent night. And of that fourth line, uh, one of the guys who really stood out the most was Daniel Torgerson. Now, Torgerson's a name I've talked about before because he's a really big body, he's got some really solid mobility, and he has a pretty nice shot. But, you know, for the past couple of weeks, it's been slow getting him back up to speed and seeing what he can do at the pro levels. Obviously, there's a nice tool set that he's got, but getting that in and translating it to the NHL is still, you know, it is a bit of a jump, right? He had a pretty solid season with the Moose last year, but this was just his first year in North America, so he still has room to grow. Now, he had a brace tonight with two goals. Both of them were in really good positions. Uh, the first goal was a beautiful one-timer from Kyle Connor. The second one, I don't recall entirely what he did, but I'm pretty sure it was a nice release. I just can't quite recall it from, uh, you know, the Jets having a bit of a crazy evening, and I was trying to keep track of a number of different events, but... On the whole, Torgerson was still noticeable, whether it was grinding along the walls in the forecheck, uh, setting up some good passing lanes. I thought he had a couple of really dangerous chances. He almost had a hat trick on a number of occasions. He would drive towards the net from a wide position, get right in front of the goalie and try to jam it home. So I think for me, Torgerson might still be about a year away. I think he needs some more time with the Moose, just because, again, this was, was basically against the Belleville Suns. And jumping up to the NHL level, uh, it's hard to say where his skill set really projects. I think he's comfortably going to be like a middle six winger, uh, maybe even boosted to the second line in terms of or in times of emergency. But for the most part, I would expect him to be on that third line right now, though. I think Appleton kind of has the right wing spot locked up. So uh, the only way he'd really get in is maybe on the third line if Winnipeg feels he's ready for the dance. But they might want to hold him back just a little bit because, of course, it did, they did bring in um, Sam Gagne or or maybe Torgerson is competing for the left wing spot on the opposite side. Now, Torgerson, as good as he was, he was not the only player who really impressed me from the forward ranks. I would say that Saku Manalainen is probably earning his way onto the, onto the Jets um, either for a depth role or maybe even a little bit more prominent ice time elsewhere. I don't think he'll be a top sixer at all, but if you're looking for a guy who can be a really solid two-way creator in your bottom six or middle six, it seems like Saku is the perfect player for this. Uh, it's really funny because I don't recall him, was it last year he, he arrived? I don't know if I really saw much of him during preseason or camp, and so this year, kind of seeing what he can really do uh, with some of these training camp scrims and stuff, I've been really impressed with him. I think he's got a lot of versatile tool sets. And I would suspect that he has done, en done enough to start earning a, a longer look with the Jets' big club. Um, does he seem like the kind of guy who's going to be a really big goal scorer or anything? No, but I think what he does well is have a really aggressive forward check. I think that he's very good in possession. He finds himself attacking the slot and working well in the face-off circles. I think that he's just really competent at getting the puck to dangerous areas. And sometimes for the Jets, that's all you really need. You know, Winnipeg in the past has had really good finishers. Uh, currently, it's a little bit of a dry spell in terms of finishing talent. But, you know, over the next few years, I think we'll see more of those players trickle in. But even just having a guy who can ferry the puck into those dangerous areas and set up some of those finishers that are currently on the team would be really important because we don't have a lot of that. The Jets forward depth is very thin. And if the Jets can find some internal help, um, especially since they don't really seem intent on signing guys externally, then I think that wouldn't be too bad of an outcome. So Manalainen, really good night. Torgerson, very good night. Um, anyone else in particular that stood out? Um, I mean, Perfetti, Wheeler, you know, those guys just kind of did what they usually do. Same for the top line. I mean, Kyle Connor also had a brace, but you sort of expect that. I mean, it's against Belvo, right? Uh, so I'm looking more for for standouts from the guys that we don't really see too, too often. Other than that, I mean, Mikey Eisenman, I thought, had a productive evening. Eisenman, I, I always see him as a guy who works really hard, 
gets the puck into uh, ad- advantageous positions. He just doesn't really have that next level to his game that I think would translate him to a longer term NHL or so. He is a player to watch as maybe like a call up or something in terms of injuries. But I think in terms of like competing for maybe a bottom six slot this year, it's probably not happening. So, yeah, I think he still has some work to do. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if he anchors Manitoba's top six. He's very industrious. He always does a lot of the hard work grinding along the corners and trying to create offense while being you know covered by two to three skaters. It's just in terms of actual scoring outputs and stuff, it, it still hasn't really hit a level where I think he would supplant maybe somebody like Sakuma Nalainen. So interesting guy to keep an eye on. We'll see if he starts to really shine for the moose and if he can maybe add a little bit of a scoring touch to his versatile game. But of course, I'd be curious to know what you all thought of this preseason game, which players stood out to you, uh, either in a positive or a negative light. Be sure to let me know in the uh, YouTube comments below. Let me know what you think about Rick Bonus's job so far. What do you think he needs to improve upon? What have you enjoyed uh, seeing with what his tactical changes are bringing? Again, let me know in the comments below or at my social medias at HLLivingLoco and LO underscore Winnipeg Jets on Twitter. For tonight's episode, though, that is going to be all the time that we have. Thank you for making Locked On Jets your first listen of the day every day. Be sure to make your second listen Locked On NHL. Our experts give you a daily 30-minute podcast on all things NHL all year long. As always, it is free to subscribe, uh, so be sure to like, follow, and uh, give them a subscription right now. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Have a great night, and go Jets go.